Rachel, I'm the director of housing. I'm the director of Housing Alliance Delaware. And I wanted to just uh, open today's meeting by letting you know that Dana uh, Mitchell, the Continuum of Care Board Chair, is not able to be here today. Um, but we are excited that Susan Kent has uh, accepted the nomination and officially been approved to be our new uh, Continuum of Care Board Vice Chair. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Susan Kent. Thank you, Susan, for taking on this leadership role and for uh, being here with us today. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Yeah, I was just thinking about it, it was, uh, I think, 2015, we all met at the Buena Vista Hotel and started this mm -hmm. continuum of care, and it was so cool to see all the different um, parts of people helping um, the homeless population come together with a, a, a like yoke that we want to make sure that we have housing for everyone in Delaware. So this is an honor to, to lead, um, but we have a very biz busy agenda. So I, I say we just jump right in and um, start our agenda with the COC business and the uh, COC funding. Thank you, Susan. Um, and before we get started with business, I'll also just add many of you know each other and I recognize a lot of your names. Um, but I'm sure not all of you know each other. So if you have a second, please feel free to put in the chat your name and the organization that you work with or the entity you represent um, so that everyone has a sense of, of who's here. So you can go ahead and go to the first vetting slide. Next one. There we go. All right. Uh, we are going to kick off the meeting um, just with a couple quick COC funding updates. Uh, the first update that we have is that the 2022 COC awards have been released by HUD. Um, the um, COC process is an annual competitive process for um, homeless assistance dollars through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, this year, we were awarded um, $8.9 million um, as a result of the 2022 competition. Uh, we were awarded 100% of our renewal amount and 95% of our total funding request. Um, and all grants awarded um, as a result of the 2022 competition will begin operating in 2023 and expire in 2020. 24. Um, so they will start this year and end next year. Uh, the link there um, at the bottom is um, the uh, to take you to the HUD Awards Archives page, where you can see um, the history of all of the Delaware Continuum of Care Awards, um, as well as all of the awards uh, across the state. Uh, and we just have a graphic right here of all of the different uh, breakdown of the project types uh, and the funding awarded by project type for the 2022 awards. I'm going to hand it off to Susan. Okay, um, we're going to be talking about the 2023 um, COC priorities. A few meetings ago, the COC came together and we discussed um, what we wanted to focus on. And this isn't a comprehensive list. We have to, in order to be effective, we have to make the list something we can accomplish. Um, so we we came up with these six. Um, priorities for our, our COC. And just to give a little bit of history about, you know, why, why do we need to set up priorities? Um, according to the no notice of funding through NOFA, we really need to remain competitive and we need to evaluate our programs that are in alignment with um, the selection criteria and policies and procedures found in that NOFA. Um, so we come together um, and, and have created these, these priorities to be, to be compliant with what HUD is asking us to do with these dollars that are coming into Delaware. HUD strongly encourages our COCs to develop local priorities in addition to HUD priorities to help inform their project um, to review and the ranking process. These, process, um, these priorities that we've um, outlined here, these six priorities will help inform decisions about how to strategically prioritize COC funding in Delaware. We will also use them to evaluate the performance of the COC funded projects to determine which are best helping to achieve our COC goals. And we will use uh, them to guide our work of the COC board and the COC committees. 
engage with education and community. So our first one you see up is increasing affordable housing. <laughs> and that's um, because that's on everyone's agenda. If we had um, the supply, if we had the inventory, obviously we would um, see a, a significant drop in um, the people experiencing homelessness. The lack of affordable housing is the main driver of homelessness nationally and has been identified as a critical issue by local homeless assistance housing providers. This shortage of units impairs our ability to place clients in permanent housing, even when we have the funds to do so. That, so that's um, one of the reasons why we've made this a priority. Um, and how we're gonna do this, it, how is the COC gonna um, provide, you know, pr prioritize increasing affordable housing? We're gonna prioritize projects. Um, the COC funding that created new and additional permanent housing units for people experiencing homelessness. So we're gonna prioritize projects. We're gonna be working with the PHAs to increase access to PHA vouchers. And um, we're gonna increase the number of permanent supportive housing units available for the most vulnerable people that are experiencing homelessness. And the third way we're going to increase affordable housing supply is by engaging local leaders around things like zone, zoning and land use um, to increase the affordable housing supply. Our second priority that we've um, identified is improving systems performance. And those are generated in the CMIS, Community Management Information System. And those, um, that data includes statewide metrics. Um, systems perfor performance measures, we call them SPMs, help us understand how we are responding and solving to homelessness in Delaware and how it is used by HUD each year to evaluate our COC progress. The Delaware COC will prioritize improving systems performance by prioritizing the COC uh, funding that perform well on systems of performance and our metrics would be improved systems performance um, if funded. So in other words, would that project do better if it was funded. So that's something we're gonna prioritize. And also um, to help in improving our system's performance, we're gonna be working to increase the CMIS coverage and continuously monitoring and, and improving CMS, um, CMIS data quality. Our third, using, um, our third priority will be using housing first approach. And this is evidence-based, and I know everyone's heard it um, over and over again, but this model prioritizes moving people experiencing homelessness into permanent housing quickly. And it does so by removing those barriers to housing and providing appropriate community-based supports. And the services are tailored towards those households. The COC will um, prioritize the housing first by prioritizing projects for the COC that are funded that operate in alignment to the housing first model. And we will also provide training, uh, technical assistance and resources to programs on housing first implementation. So training is really important. You'll see throughout all of our priorities that we've set that we wanna make sure that we're getting the, the boots on the ground trained and that that's gonna be a priority for us this year. Incorporating persons with lived experience is a fourth priority. And HUD encourages our COC to include people who have lived experience. Um, people with lived experience should participate in determining how local policies may need to be revised and updated to improve effectiveness um, of the homeless assistance program. This is critical. You need to have the people that we're serving telling us what the needs are because they've lived it. They know what, what the things are. So they need to be a part of our process. Number five for our priorities is racial justice and equity. Um, we're respond, responding to preventing and ending homelessness should address racial inequities uh, to ensure successful outcomes for all persons experiencing homelessness um, by using proven approaches. How are we gonna do that? The COC prioritize, how will we prioritize racial justice and equity? By working to ensure representation is in place where decisions are being made. By advancing racial justice by equity work through the Racial Justice Equity Committee of the COC. By considering the extent to which the COC has funded projects are working to advance racial equity 
and the COC project, project evaluations by performing an analysis of outcomes by race to identify disparities at the system level and by assessing coordinated entry to ensure equitable outcomes uh, by racial group. And finally, but not um, least, our sixth priority is disability rights. People living with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by homelessness, yet many services intended to serve people experiencing homelessness are unable to meet the needs of this population. Additionally, many um, household providers do not comply with their legal obligations to provide suitable housing. The COC is going to prioritize disability rights by prior prioritizing COC funding for the projects that create new housing units dedicated to people with disabilities, providing training and education for housing. There's that training again. Uh, for housing and shelter, state staff and rights of people with disabilities and how to make responsible accommodations. And finally, to develop strategies to ensure that people with disabilities are included in the decision-making and process and advocacy for solutions happening. So um, I, we have um, worked really hard on coming up with uh, these priorities. We know that it's not comprehensive and that there's a lot of things that we can focus on, but putting it into six for our, for our COC, um, you know, to real, we want to do it. We don't want to just say it. So um, this, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Do we need to vote these in, Rachel? No, Susan, um, okay. these were already adopted by the COC board and they're in place, um, but we wanted to make sure that everyone who's involved in the COC was aware. I guess the next item on the agenda is going to be the 2023 Delaware COC Notice of Intent. Thanks, Susan. Um, so this will also be very brief, again, as a part of COC business. So for um, organizations that, well, that have received COC funding in the past, but those who have not and are interested, um, this is relevant to both of you. Um, we released a Notice of Intent a number of weeks ago. Um, it's up on our website, um, and really the idea here is that this notice of intent provides um, some really basic high-level information about the continuum of care funding process. Um, it is a uh, notice that we intend to release um, the request for COC project proposals um, for funding through the continuum of care later this year, which we do every year, um, but releasing a notice of intent is new, and the reason we did that is we want to start the conversation sooner. Um, let fo have folks start thinking about if they're thinking about projects um, or how they may or may be able to use continuum of care funding to support, um, as Susan said, the creation of new supportive housing units um, or their work to, to house folks who are experiencing homelessness, that they start thinking about it sooner rather than later. Um, the notice of intent itself is a document that outlines things like who's eligible to apply for the money, how you can use the funds, um, who is eligible to be served with the dollars, um, and as I said, uh, 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 eligible costs that you can use the funding for and a like outline of the process. Um, what folks are asked to do is if they are interested in, um, in applying, um, it's not required, but we ask folks to complete a notice of intent a survey that we created that helps us to see what they're thinking, um, what type of program they are thinking about asking funding for so that we can have a conversation with folks um, uh, and better understand what, what people are thinking about in the community, provide some technical assistance. Um, like any type of federal funding, it's it can be complicated to understand what it can and can't be used for and its best uses in the community um, and all the rules uh, required. So we wanna just get ahead of it a little bit. So please check it out if you're considering applying um, for new dollars at all um, as a new agency or an existing agency. Um, as I said, it's not required that you complete the survey um, in order to be eligible to apply for funds later this year when we release the um, uh, RFP for, for the official RFP, um, but this is just a helpful way. Um, and while we haven't done it yet, very soon in the next couple of weeks, we'll be reaching out to organizations who did uh, submit a survey through um, the notice of intent um, to have some one-on-one -on -one meetings and just talk about their plans. So uh, be aware. Um, 
complete the survey or uh, reach out to Aaron or myself if you have any questions. Oh, oops, I'll go back one more real quick. Um, we also just want to um, highlight that the 2023 um, continuum of care funding policies have been approved um, as of this month. Um, the funding policies are reviewed annually by both the um, COC funding committee and the non-conflicted COC board, um, and they are what govern our local process um, for which we review score, select, and rank projects that are submitted to HUD for funding each year. Um, so those are also live and available on the website. Um, for any interested projects um, and renewal projects who want to get a jump on um, reading up on the on what's involved in that process this year. Um, and you're good. That was it. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, we're going to go over. Did, Aaron, did you just do the COC advocacy and policy? Nope. That's it. That's Nick. Okay. Um, so we're going to go uh, right in with Nick and Tony sharing about the uh, COC advocacy and policy. Yeah, I'm so Betty. sorry that Tony can't be here today. Um, oh, okay. Or perhaps I just shoved him away to get my spotlight. Who knows? Um, but it's great for all of you to be here today. I'm so excited to see you. Uh, Tony and I are the co-chairs of the Advocacy and Policy Committee of the COC. And we spend a lot of time talking about how we as a housing community can be better advocates, make sure that we're really ensuring that the voices of people who need affordable housing and those who provide housing services are heard. Um, and we just recently came up with our agenda for the next year. So I'm really excited to share that with all of you. All right, so in 2023, um, a lot of this is going to sound familiar to a lot of you at uh, things that I think you've been saying that you really want us to have. So we're going to continue to work for a funding of affordable housing units and make sure that we're increasing access. We all know that one of the biggest issues in Delaware is the actual lack of units. Um, so that's something that we're going to continue to draw attention to and maintain focus on. This is going to be in a couple ways. The first of all is going to be um, ensuring that more affordable housing units are produced. Uh, working with the Housing Alliance on their legislation to ensure that more funding is put into affordable housing, and also working on the source of income protection. We want to make sure the people who are low income and relying on housing vouchers are able to access affordable housing um, as much as anyone else. That's a big priority for us this year. And also making sure that people are in stable housing. I think someone described eviction as a little bit of musical chairs. There's a finite amount of affordable housing, um, and we worry that if someone faces eviction, they won't be able to retain another affordable unit. So we are also focusing on passing the right to representation. I know a lot of you are part of that effort, and thank you for all you're doing. Finally, we really want to talk about criminal penalties for people who are homeless and how to make sure that those are minimized as much as possible and discussing the practicalities. So we are focusing on the Homeless Bill of Rights, um, which is currently sitting in committee and working with Housing Alliance Delaware on their work to support people who are victimized on the basis of panhandling or loitering. All of those are our agenda for 2023 and we're excited. And the obligatory um, push is that I know all of you are doing this work in your communities, and we would really, really love for you to be able to come to our committee meetings and share what you're doing. Be a part of it. Let's make sure that we can work together on it. Please email us. Please sign up to attend the meetings. I promise uh, it's more than just me talking. We have a great time, and it's always good to hear what you're working on. So I would love if you can join us. As you can see from our agenda, we have a busy year this year. So please get involved. Awesome, Nick. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing on that committee. And I will just, you know, say absolutely join, um, be a part of the solution. You know, that's, that's, the, and how do we do that? And that's by um, joining these committees and having these conversations. This is kind of like the quarterly meetings 
you know, are, are, are great because you get a big overview, but it, the real meat of what we're learning and how we can work together as a COC is in these committees. So um, next on our agenda is the LGBTQ and uh, equal access training. And we're going to have, who's doing that training today for us? Who am I introducing? Hey, so um, I uh, the training is actually not today. I am just um, going to kind of go over um, the training with you all. Um, so uh, we have the LGBTQ training coming up on June 22nd um, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, we're going to be covering um, things such as the equal access rule um, by HUD, as well as how to um, serve um, clients who identify um, as part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, this will be hosted by Carla Fleshman, which um, I know a lot of you, our providers, um, work very closely with her, so we'll be facilitated by Carla Fleshman, um, as long as um, as well as Jim Bay and Chetta from um, P Flag, um, that will be doing some um, technical assistance. Um, so we are very excited for this um, training that's coming up. Um, it is still time to register. Um, this I'm sure this PowerPoint will be um, shared with everyone, which will have the link um, to be able to register for this training. Um, I do see we have Jim Bayan Chet on the call. Um, Jim, if there's anything you want to add, um, please feel free. Um, but other than that, we um, would love to see you all join us. Uh, nothing, nothing further to add. Uh, Felicia, thanks for the really nice summary, and we look forward to seeing people on the June 22nd. Thanks, Jim. And there, there is a question in the chat. Um, are CEUs available for this training? So we are currently working on obtaining CEU training uh, credits for this training. Um, and so more information um, about that will be um, forthcoming. And I will put the um, registration link in the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Felicia. Moving on our agenda, we're going to go over our HAD policy and advocacy updates. Um, Sonia is our policy and advocacy director, and uh, she's going to share with us today. Thank you, Sonia, for all the work you do. I know you're a busy gal. <laughs> thank you, and thank you all. Um, I'm going to have to ask you, though, to stop sharing um, so I can share my slides if that's OK. Thank you so much. Um, so great minds think alike. Um, Nick and I are going to share, I'm not going to go in great detail to everything that Nick already said, but some of our um, policy initiatives are the same. So hopefully some of this will just emphasize and magnify what she had said. She mentioned the musical chairs, which I have there as a graphic. I think it's really important when we talk about the lack of housing that we talk about people who have been pushed into housing. Just like when you play musical chairs, somebody has to lose. The system is rigged, right? When you have a shortage of housing, somebody has to lose. People didn't fall into it. They didn't make a mistake. They didn't you know, take the wrong turn. They didn't do something wrong. They were pushed into it because our society's lack of affordable housing. And the only way they can rebuild their lives is if we give them that housing, if we provide that housing for them. So what you all know from the gap is there's a shortage of over 21,000 affordable and available rental homes for people who are extremely low income. That means there's more shortage for people who are below 50 and 80 AMI as well. Nationally, there are 33 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 extremely low income renters. Delaware only has 27. We have less available for low, extremely low income folk than the national average. That's not something that we should be settled with, not something we should be comfortable with. Um, we're going in the wrong direction. So there are three bills that I'd like to emphasize. Again, Nick already presented them. So I'm gonna go into the first one in a little more detail. And the second two I'll just mention because she already really went into them. The first one is the Affordable Housing Production Act where we would like 20% of the state portion of the Realty Transfer take Act to tax to go to new production of affordable housing every single year as a designated line item. 
What matters about this is we're really grateful that the governor gave from ARPA fundings a one-time 31.5 million, but one year won't get us out of decades of a lack of housing. The only way to get out of a lack of affordable housing is every single year to have dependable income that developers can know in multi-year projects, they will be getting money without having to go hand in hat in hand to beg for the money. So that's what we're asking for. Um, you'll get these slides and there you could see the breakdown of the slide, the different, um, the different way that the realty transfer tax is broken out. It's 4% whenever you buy or sell something in Delaware, unless it's your first time um, purchase. 2.5 of that is the state portion and we want 20% of the state portion. So what can you do? You can sign on to this letter. This euro will take you to this letter. You can also find it on our website. It's a letter of support saying that you support this initiative. We are gonna be handing that letter out to our legislators at Day for Housing. I'll get to Day for Housing in a second. Um, so we want your name on it. So if you haven't, if you've already signed on, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you've not already signed on, please um, email Rachel or me and let us know you want a copy of the letter, you have some questions, some concerns, anything we can help to make your board and or you make a decision and then let us know so we can put your name on the list. Legislation number two is right to representation. It is coming back. Um, it has made it out of the Senate, out of the House Housing Committee it now needs to go to appropriations, whether it's gonna be walked around the appropriations and or there's a hearing, we're not sure yet, we'll let you know. And then um, homeless bill of rights, as Nick said, is in the committee. We're just waiting to hear when they want testimonies. So those are the three bills that we're um, following. And what you can do if you haven't already, some of you already have, thank you registered to become a housing advocate. Again, you'll get this in the URL, we'll take you right to the place on our website, but where we ask you to register, I promise you, you rarely get more than one email during session a week, if that, and off session, you won't get more than one a month. But it's where I will let you know when there's learning opportunities, webinars, where there's opportunities for you to testify. We're going to have it, we have it broken down by district. So it might be that eventually we're going to look at things that are specific to your locality, your municipality. So please, please sign up. What you can also do is come to Day for Housing. Did I mention Day for Housing is coming up? It is true. Day for Housing is coming up May 18th from 12 to 3. We want you to come. We want you to carpool with your neighbors. We want you to allow your employees to come to Day for Housing as part of their work week. We want you to tell your clients of the day, about the day and let them know there's free transportation to Dover from Newcastle and Sussex. On the flyer that's in the next slide that you will get, there's a link that they, if they need transportation, they could sign up. We would love you to educate your board and volunteers about the importance of affordable housing and coming today for housing. Invite me to come and talk to any group you would like and compete, hot off the press, compete to be the COC organization gets the most people today for housing on May 18th. Prize is still to be determined. You could see um, email Aaron with your suggestions of what would make this prize worthwhile for your organization to participate. But if you are competing, oh, there was a typo in that. I apologize. Um, I will fix that. If you are competing for this, each person must identify their organization when they sign up. Because basically, I'm not going back and figuring out what people are from what organization. We're going to go um, to the different organizations and let Aaron know who the winner is. It's really exciting. It's getting a lot of really good momentum, and we need you there. The truth of the matter is, there is no day for housing if people don't show up. And legislators are right. They don't read our minds. They can't know what we want to do unless we show up to tell them what we want them to do. They are our employees. They are elected by us. They represent us. And we have a moral and ethical responsibility to be there to share with them what they need to do. So if you have ideas, if you're interested, if you have questions, let me know. My contact information is there and anything I can do to help.
I'm open to. I don't know if there's time for questions, but if there is, I'm amicable. Otherwise, people could put them in the chat and I can answer them later. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I'm thinking a weekend getaway for the uh, whole office. Is that something? <laughs> I mean, we have um, we have a lot of people that have property in Rehoboth. I'm not even saying Tahiti here. So <laughs> that might be a something we could do. Massages in, included. <laughs> um, if there's no questions for Sonia, we'll move on to our next agenda item. Sonia, can I mention like the key idea at this, like just. I'm going to ask you to hold, I mean, you can mention it as an idea. We're not 100% sure where we're going to go with it. There's still some more discussion to go. Sure, sure. So so it, it, it wouldn't hurt if people just organically started wearing keys. So one of the ideas in one of the groups we were talking about how to um, make an impact at the, uh, what is it called, Day for Housing, Sonia? Is that, we want everyone to go to that, right? May 18th, is that the day? Um, is to wear a key because everyone should have a key to open a door, you know, home instead of like a ribbon or you could put it on a ribbon. But anyway, moving on, we have a um, special guest today from the Department of Health, and they're going to be speaking about the mobile unit presentation. Uh, John, are you ready to go? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thanks for coming. And we're looking forward to your presentation. No problem. My name is John Smiley. I'm from the Division of Public Health, and my role is a planner for the mobile unit. I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to present um, to all of you, and we'll get started here. We get into the mobile unit and all the services. I just want to go over the mission statement for public health, and it's to improve the quality, quality of life for Delaware's citizens by promoting health and well-being, fostering self-sufficiency, and protecting vulnerable populations. A quick note that I just want to add before we get started is that while it's important that we serve the underserved population, not all events will be uh, will be able to attend just because of logistical problems, whether it's parking our mobile unit, um, scheduling conflicts. We're starting to get a lot of events that are outside of business hours, which is great, but sometimes with nursing and staffing, it's a little bit harder to do those events, or if we are going to somewhere where there's already similar services to what we offer. So here's a list of the current services that we have. Um, this is what we have on the trailer right now. And this is what we'll be offering at all of our community events currently. COVID and flu vaccinations, COVID at-home test kits, rapid HIV testing and counseling, blood lead screenings, clinic referrals, and we have a ton of outreach and education packets uh, that we disperse to the community. And a lot of um, community partners that we have donate stuff to us and we put it out and then we also give those out maybe when we're not doing an event with just them. On the left hand side you'll see our current flyer. Um, this just kind of goes over this is what we send out to the community and everyone in our organization and it just will have the location, address, date and time and then my contact number will be on there if anyone has any questions. We are updating our flyer, so it will change a little bit um, visually, but it'll still have all the important information on it and all of our services listed on it. So we do a lot of collaborations with a bunch of community-based organizations and community programs. Um, this is just a few of them you'll see here that we do. Uh, the WPD, we work with them every Thursday um, for two hours. We go to different areas in the community and it's a group of uh, jewels and we give away all kinds of community resources. We give away vegetables. Um, some of the other people there give away vegetables. We're trying to improve the view of the community and the police and we have a big mobile unit, so it's very easy for us to stand out and draw attention to us. We also partner with the Department of Justice once a month. Uh, so Community Center, we go there every other week. The LACC, we go there once a month as well. And Goodwill of Delaware, they have job fairs that we attend uh, usually every month. They haven't had one for a couple months. Um, 
Interfaith Community Housing in Delaware. We've gone there a few times and had a pretty good turnout. And also Better Tomorrow's, which is uh, right by the prison in uh, Wilmington. So our mobile unit is staffed with two nurses and then three to four support staff. Our support staff are community health worker certified, which pretty much just means that they are, um, they can provide education, preventative and curative care. And they are the liaison between the community and getting them the services and healthcare that they need. So at events, if anyone would like a service that we do not have on the mobile unit, their job is to kind of connect them to one of our public health um, state service centers and help them get the services that they may need. We are also looking to add um, blood pressure screenings and diabetes and blood sugar screenings. That'll come in the coming months. And with our flyers, we have a distribution list that goes out to all three counties. So this is just, I'm just presenting for Newcastle County, but we also have a mobile unit in Kent and Sussex County as well. And as we get further in the presentation, I'll have the contact information for the Kent and Sussex planner. So you guys can get in contact with them if you need, or if you're interested in scheduling an event. Over time, we have done summer, winter, we're pretty much out all year round. In the winter months, we try to do indoor events um, just because the weather may not be as friendly and it's a bit harder for us to safely get to the events with the truck and trailer combination. So for the summer, the mobile unit and, it's, and our team will be focusing mainly on outdoor events, partnering with local organizations to reach as many potential clients as possible. Um, we still may do pop-up events, which is just going to certain parts in the community that are underserved and trying to offer our services, but we're going the route of trying to get more organized events. We seem to have a better turnout and it benefits all parties involved. And our schedule will be at least three times a week. Um, we may have more depending on who reaches out things like that. I do have a question here that says county. Um, this is this presentation was for Newcastle County, but we are statewide as well. So there are units in Kent and Sussex as well. If you're interested in organizing with me, my, my email is right here. Email is the best way to contact me. Phone calls tend to get lost or so easier for me to keep track through email. I mentioned before, there's some limitations to events that we can go to logistically. And here's just a list of some of them. And locations and partners must be able to offer all services. We have a couple of schools reaching out now that want to do lead testing specifically. While we can do that, we have to offer all services, all of our service lines uh, moving forward. While we can still kind of focus on one thing, we would like to offer all services. Below, Okima Perry is the planner for Kent and Sussex County. So if you're interested in scheduling an event in either Kent or Sussex, please feel free to reach out to her through email and we will try to get you guys connected and events set up moving forward. Just like to thank you guys for giving me the, these slides get mixed around. This, this was a slide that was supposed to be further in the presentation, I apologize. Um, this is just kind of what has happened with the mobile unit since its start. It's been in service for over a year and a half, getting close to two years now. And it was originally staffed and operated with the Delaware National Guard and they were primarily focused on COVID vaccinations and COVID testing. In the summer of 2022, services were added. I've mentioned the list of services now and the locations were increased to get further out of just the city and offer more services to people in vulnerable populations. I'd like to thank you guys for the opportunity to present. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much, John. Um, what a great resource. I think we, um, you know, especially like 
getting it mobile, getting it to, to the resource is so critical. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Um, next on our agenda is the updates and announcements. I don't have any, but I'm sure Housing Alliance Delaware might have some to share. Or anyone else. Um, I wanna open it up to, I think we've done a number of announcements already. So I definitely wanna ask folks here to, to share if they have any community events or resources or trainings or things that they'd like to share with the community. Good morning, um, this is Stacey Schamberger um, with the Lifelines Program at West Bend Neighborhood Health. Thank you for the opportunity, Rachel. I just wanted to um, let everybody know if you are not already aware uh, of our drop-in center for um, homeless youth. So our services are for youth between the ages of, of between 18 to 23 years old. Um, we're located at 1708 West 8th Street in Wilmington, um, right up the, the block, a block and a half from West End Neighborhood House. So uh, we're providing all services, excluding uh, shelter services. So um, we act more as a day shelter and can provide support um, for youth at that point. So if you run across um, anyone who fits the age group and the mold of unaccompanied youth, please feel free to send them our way. Um, there's no referral required, no phone calls or anything like that needed. Um, just send them on over and, and we'll be able to support. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Does anyone else have anything they think would be good for the community to know about what they're doing or working on or resources they have available? Hey, Rachel and everyone. Hi, it's Renee. Hey, Renee. Sorry. Hey, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to share... Uh, an event that we had created around uh, the uh, COVID homelessness emergency uh, housing and that we've carried on because it's been such a success. And I wanna encourage anyone to participate, but every right now, every third Thursday at each county, we have a community resource fair. And it's uh, our clients, who come through the state service center, we inform them, but we also are informing the community. So it's been a huge success. We have a lot of different um, agencies within the department and other community agencies and housing agencies that also share that they have been successful in reaching out and giving their information. I will send, um, the flyers because they're uh, different locations. This will be happening tomorrow. Um, and if you want to reserve, uh, you would need to do it in advance and we can get you on the mailing list to reserve your table. But for tomorrow, we're going to be in Newcastle County. We're going to be at the Hope Center from uh, 10 to two. Down in Kent County, we'll be at the Williams State Service Center from 10 to one and then down in Sussex will be at the Laurel State Service Center um, from 10 to one. We use state service centers and we also use other community centers. For the summer, we're looking to do evenings and weekends. So I would make sure that you all have this resource in case there's something coming up, you feel that you wanna get to the community and really have that face-to-face -face experience. But we have just found them to be extremely successful uh, for the community. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Renee. Hey y'all, it's Enyo from Kapurwa King County. Hey, hey I just wanted to Hey, I want to say thank you to all the, um, you know, members of the Alliance, our, you know, our, our emergency shelter in King County ended April 1st. We were able, we had around 22 um, women and children on an ongoing basis. And at the end of um, our period, we were able to place all the women and children in um, a COC pro project or, um, you know, maybe, a, you know, family members home. Um, the men, we were able to do a portion but not um, all of them. So, you know, we're finalizing all those numbers. Just want to say thank you because, you know, that's, you know, we were really depressed because we saw a lot more veterans this year than ever. But, you know, this is the first year we can say, hey, all the ladies and children, they found somewhere to go. Um, you know, we've, we, we did have one of the ladies already come back and, you know, she's like, I, I want to I stay here with you guys at Copurple. And I'm like, 
But we are having some new projects projects coming with Code Purple with permanent supportive housing um, growing in King County. We did have a meeting with the city council to address the 401 Water Street in Dover to, um, because it was offered to us. And then um, but the um, police at that time um, at this meeting last week said that they want that property. They haven't used it in over 10 years and we made that aware, but they want to use it just, I guess, for safety or just to do training. But um, we are looking at a property with Kent County to partner because we have a grant for ARPA with the um, levy court that's pending. So we are looking for a property um, in Kent County to do permanent supportive housing. And then, um, and other than that, we know we, do, we are gonna have our Love My City Day the first Saturday of each month. Um, we do have a volunteer party. Sorry, one. Sorry, I was getting a call. We, um, and we do have a volunteer party for any Code Purple King County volunteers on May 13th at our office at the 1207 um, East Division Street. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Ennio, for the update. Thank you. Well, if there's um, other announcements, feel free to chime in real quick um, or continue to put announcements in the chat. Um, hearing none, I'm going to move on, on on our agenda. We have an emergency um, benefit. Me, I think SOF just has a couple um, sure. upcoming events to go. Awesome, really great. Quick. Um, I will make this really quick and um, easy. All of this information, again, will be included on the slide. So we'll send up a follow-up email to everybody who attended. So you will have access to this afterwards as well. Um, we have two local events um, coming up. We actually currently ongoing is the YWCA Racial Justice um, Challenge. Um, there's also a upcoming professional development opportunities through um, Trauma Matters Delaware. And then we also have some community resources. Um, the school board election is coming up and Vote Delaware is offering a um, voting plan as well as some local, um, some resources to make um, help make that a lot easier for everybody. And we also have some upcoming webinars. Um, the National Alliance to End Homelessness is going to be hosting um, two, one this week, one next. And then um, Pathways to Housing, Housing First University is also offering these four webinars over the next few months. Um, all this information is again going to be sent out to everybody available um, and the links to the registration is included on the slides. But if you have any questions, feel free just to reach out. And I think that was all that I had. Awesome. Awesome. Again, um, if anyone else has anything to share, you can speak, interrupt me now or put it in the chat. But uh, we'll Oh, and in the chat, uh, the question was, when is the uh, PIT um, results due? And Rachel answered, um, our 2023 PIT results will be um, in about two weeks, um, be revealed for everyone to have that data. So moving on to my uh, friend, John Whitelaw, he's going to be talking with us today about emergency benefits, assisting assistance training. And uh, John, you ready to rock and roll? I'm not sure if I'm ready, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to give everyone a good a, a good laugh for a minute. So I've got my uh, professional background on because I'm embarrassed to show my office, and you'll see why in just a minute. Um, that's what my office looks like, and that is just and just not professional. So we will do the professional background so people think that I'm organized. Um, I'm going to talk. I'm not sure how long people should feel free to put questions in the chat while I'm talking. And I'm hoping someone can grab them and interrupt me as we're going along and ask them if when 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 that, that seems appropriate. I certainly don't mind that, but I can't monitor the chat while I'm presenting. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about public assistance and various benefits. Um, a couple of bad things that have happened recently. Uh, and then a couple of um, import, small but important changes um, because you've got to have a little bit of good news um, uh, when things are happening. So I'm going to share my screen because I think it will be helpful uh, rather than just listening to me talk for a little bit, um, seeing some things. If you, uh, I think, I, I believe I sent the presentation um, previously and I'm happy for um, the COC to share this with all the participants and you are welcome to use it as you see fit. 
um, if you find it helpful. So I'm going to share my screen. We'll see if I can overcome technology here. Um, and then someone's going to tell me if we're good. I don't know. Are we from the beginning? Yep, we can see it, John. We're good, and we just have one. We just have one slide up. No, no you got to do the. You got to do the display. Uh, my display setting. You can do it. You're almost there. How's that? Perfect. I got to figure out why it defaults to that one, but that's okay. Um, so we're really going to be talking about uh, 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 most of the presentation. We're going to be talking about unwinding of the PHE. And for those, it's fairly obvious, but it's the, the, the public health emergency. And it has significant effects both on Medicaid. Medicaid is, one, is another term. It's a synonym for medical assistance. Um, so you know, anytime you see the word Medicaid, it means medical assistance, which is the basic health care program administered by DHSS for low income folks and other vulnerable um, individuals and families. SNAP is the current term. Um, it's been around now, I don't know, 10 or 15 years for what many of us used to call food stamps. And, and in, in our community, I will say many families still call it food stamps. And I am, uh, I am not a particular fan of SNAP as a term of art. Um, perhaps food benefits would be better, but SNAP is just kind of silly. Um, but in any event, uh, a word about us. Um, many people on the call will know who uh, know who we are at Community Legal Aid, but a few may not. Um, we are a law firm. We are a, a statewide nonprofit law firm. We have offices in all three uh, counties. We have an office in Georgetown. Um, uh, we have an office in Dover, and we have an office in Wilmington. So we serve um, Delawareans throughout the state. Um, our mission uh, is to combat injustice. Uh, and we do that through hopefully mostly creative um, advocacy and then when we need to be persistent advocacy. So yes, we can be annoying. That's because we are persistent um, and that is uh, part of what we do. We are also um, have been designated by Congress to be Delaware's um, what is called Protection and Advocacy Agency. Uh, every state has an agency that um, uh, advocates for people with disabilities and we are the designated agency in Delaware to do that. Um, here's a little word about me. I'm not going to stay on that too long. I have been a legal aid lawyer for about 35 years. Um, I came back to Delaware five years ago, uh, and I am thrilled to be doing this work in Delaware. Um, I've also practiced in West Virginia. Uh, all of my children are from, were born in West Virginia, um, uh, Minnesota, and Philadelphia. Um, today, we're going to learn about, um, I hope, uh, important changes to TANF, SNAP, and Medicaid. Um, understand how the public health emergency uh, termination will affect these programs and uh, be equipped to spot a client who has a benefits issue. Uh, and I think that last one is very important. Uh, for those of you who do direct service, uh, I think there is a significant lack of understanding that we are available to assist and help people who have difficulties with their benefits. So if you are working with someone who has either been reduced or terminated or denied, you should send them to our office. Sometimes um, you know, we can solve them and sometimes we can't, but we absolutely want to hear from individuals whose benefits have been denied, terminated, reduced, or anything other negative about their benefits. And when I say benefits, I mean TANF, which you know, we'll talk a little bit about, SNAP, Medicaid, SSI, Social Security. We're not talking about SSI and Social Security today, but anyone who is having trouble with those benefits, you should be referring them um, to us to see if we can assist them. Okay, let's go back to some basics. Um, what is TANF? TANF is uh, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. I'm going to go on a little bit of a historical detour. Um, uh, up until 1996, yeah, I know, I know that's 27 years ago, um, but pr before 1996, TANF did not exist. It used to be called Aid to Families with Dependent Children. TANF is a creature of the Newt Gingrich Congress, uh, Congress and the Contract with America with a big, terrible, from our perspective, emphasis on the word temporary. Um, uh, it is a cash assistance grant, and that really should say to extraordinarily low income families with children. It is, and I'll show you in a minute when we get to the grant amounts, barely 20 to 25% of poverty. Uh, it is, uh, 
I will refrain from saying how bad it is in that sense, um, but it is, uh, and it, it's terrible. Um, uh, in the sense of the amounts, it's just, it's embarrassing. Um, it really is, uh, which is consequently why there are so few families on it. Um, the, the town of population in Delaware, like many other states, is tiny. Um, you have to meet income eligibility career, uh, criteria. You have to meet net income. There are work requirements. And then there's a program time, limit, which is 36 months for most families. Um, again, I, you know, I could spend an hour talking about why, you know, what difficulties and what political problems I have with it. But you would get sick of hearing about that. So we're not going to do that today. Um, I mean, I'm just going to focus on one little thing here so that you understand how difficult this program is and how desperate folks are when they're on it. A maximum grant for two people who have no other income is $270, not a week, a month, a month. $270 a month is what a parent and child, and let's be blunt here, it's almost all single uh, households uh, headed by women and many women of color. $270 a month. Um, yeah, so we spend a lot of time. It is very sad and ironic that success is keeping people on their 270, but that's where we are. Um, it was set up as a, 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 as a uh, with, with, you know, uh, with some block grant money. There were several stated goals, um, some of which were you know, sort of more uh, helpful and some of which weren't. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, uh, you will see some of these are a little archaic in many ways and are based upon um, stereotypes, especially about um, single parent families and especially, let's be blunt, about African-American families. Um, which has led to some of the uh, significant difficulties in the TANF program. This being one of them, and you know, there's there's gonna there's a spoiler. There's good news about this uh, in a couple of minutes. The TANF family cap is an incredibly draconian policy that is now uh, only uh, remains in a few states, and it basically indicates that if you have an extra child when you're on TANF, you don't get that little extra sixty or seventy dollars. Um, uh, you get, it's called a TANF family cap. And the stated purpose was to reduce out of wedlock pregnancies among recipients as if people were having a baby for the extra $70, you know, uh, ridiculous, right? Um, in any event, uh, uh, and I will say, it, it, I'm just going to say this, uh, you know, it is rooted in, in uh, and it was a fair, you know, it was allowed by the federal government. It was a state option, but the you know the entire premise of this was rooted in uh, inaccurate, false stereotypes, particularly about um, you know people who get benefits. Um, they are um, you know they are a terrible legacy. But oh, and there's no you know, and of course there is no evidence that they had any relevance to birth rate. That they had nothing, you know, there was no evidence that that having a family cat changed the birth rate. There was no evidence that it did anything other than uh, increase poverty levels amongst families. Um, and that's what it did. Um, I will say, much to their credit, I, I will say after um, 27 years, um, uh, in March, uh, the department has proposed in its regulations to get rid of the family cat. So starting next month, um, there will no longer be a family cap in Delaware. And while it is small and there's not a large number of families who are affected by this, this is an important symbolic change by the department. And we abs you know, and you will hear me criticize them left and right till the, you know, till the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, every day. However, I will, must also give them credit on this one. They get credit for this. Um, this is a uh, you know, it, 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 long time coming. No one was suing them over this. They didn't have to do this. Um, but this is an important step, particularly for those 155 or so families and important symbolically. Starting in May, there'll be no more ta uh, TANF family camp in Delaware. So I, I got to applaud the department for that. You know, I got to give them credit for that one. So that's the, that's the first piece of good news for today. Um, now let's talk about SNAP uh, or food stamps. And because I've been doing this work for such a long time, I'm probably going to refer to it usually as food stamps. Um, we all know what it is. It's monthly benefits on our card to help families pro uh, provide food, uh, to, uh, to purchase food. 
Um, there are approximately 118,000 SNAP recipients in Delaware, which is about 12% of the population. So this is a, a, a program that reaches deep into our community and provides an incredibly important benefit for low to moderate income families. Um, you know, food assistance keeps families out of poverty and makes the poverty they're in less unmanageable. Uh, it is an incredibly important um, part of uh, the social safety net. A um, couple of big picture things so that folks understand this. I suspect most people on the call know this. Entirely federally funded. So every dollar of food stamps that a family gets is being brought in from the federal government. It is not state funded. The state pays nothing for food stamps except to run the program. They pay the administrative costs, but every dollar of food stamps is paid for by the federal government. I will tell you politically, uh, um, we have a, you know, the, the, uh, the farm bill is up for its five year reauthorization now. The food stamps is part of the farm bill. So there is a big fight brewing in Congress over whether to impose work requirements and other restrictions on, on food stamps. We will be fighting that tooth and nail. Um, and at some point, I may be asking folks to weigh in on that politically, to be sending comments, to be talking. And there's not a problem with our delegation. That is not, there is no problem with Delaware's delegation on this. Um, but, you know, there are some serious threats to the food stamp program at the moment because uh, while in most cases, the Senate will stop the House from doing things that are harmful, the, the um, farm bill has to get passed because without it, there's no financial authorization for the food stamps. So that's an important thing that's brewing on the horizon. Food stamps is very important it, in, in the relative scheme of things. It has a higher income limit than many programs. I am not going to read this chart. I will tell you the important number on the end is the maximum grant for the family size. So if you're at the lowest income level and you're a single family, you can get $281 in, in food stamp benefits. It goes up by family size uh, and then there's no cap. You, know, the, you, you get a slightly larger amount, about $200 maximum, more or less um, per uh, extra family member. And differently from almost every other family, the food stamp family is everybody who lives together and eats together. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're related. I could be, you know, I'm going to pick on Susan because, you know, she's at the top of my little list here. If Susan and I were living together, even though we're unrelated uh, and we were eating and preparing food together, we would be combined for a food stamp household of two. Uh, we could do it separately, um, but it's food stamps are based upon families who live and eat together. And the one with one quirky exception that's important Children up to age 22 are mandatorily included. So if you have a 21 year old who's living at home, he or she is stuck with their parents in terms of being a food stamp household. A lot of families and a lot of advocates and social workers think that, oh, at 18, you can get your own food stamp household. Not if you're living with your parents. It's up to age 22 and there's nothing, that's a federal rule. There's probably, I think it's in the statute too. Nothing we can do about that. So you have your 20 year old living at home, they are stuck to their parents for food stamp household, and so their parents' income counts. Okay, um, uh, that's just another, uh, that's one of the columns from the other chart. We will skip over that one. So remember we had that number of 281. What happened for the last three years? For the last three years, thanks to federal funding, every family who was eligible for any dollar of SNAP got extra. Everybody was brought up to the maximum for family size. And if you were already at the maximum, you got an extra $95 extra. So this was a huge and uh, excellent program by the federal government to help needy families during the pandemic. Uh, and it, and it, may, it has made a massive difference to food insecurity in Delaware over the last three years and across the country. Uh, you know, I, it was something that, um, you know, was a... a, a, a you know, passed during um, the pandemic to expand eligibility and to reduce uh, food insecurity and hunger during the terms of the pandemic. And, it, and, it, and I will tell you, I cannot tell you what a difference it has made for our families, the families that we work with, um, particularly those who uh, were not getting the full amount, they would get a significant amount extra. Um, unfortunately, however, it's done. The last extra allotment 
was sent out in February of 23. So we are seeing now a significant increase in food insecurity. And we be, and the food bank is seeing a, a much greater need for, for food in addition to SNAP because people have lost significant amounts of food benefits suddenly. Nothing that we could do legally about this. This was, you know, there was zero legal handles on this. Um, uh, and then what happened was everybody went back to the last amount that they were getting, their regular amount. One of the difficulties was uh, a number of people didn't necessarily challenge their last notice because it was irrelevant in the sense that it didn't matter if the DHSS was telling you you got $23 in food stamps because, yeah, that's what you'd get at the beginning of the month, but you'd get your emergency allotment at the end of the month. And so everybody was actually getting the full amount. Um, so there are some folks who, for whom the last um, reassessment was incorrect. Um, uh, so people are, you know, getting a lot less, and we are, you know, we are absolutely willing to look at these. I will tell you, many of them, unfortunately, the department is right. Um, you know, the reduction is correct. Um, you know, there's a huge loss of monthly SNAP benefits for people. And you are going to see this amongst the communities you work with, amongst the families you work with. There has been, starting in March, a big drop off in, in SNAP allotments, uh, which is why it's even more important that the amounts be correct. And so if you have people who are unhappy with their SNAP benefits, absolutely, you can send them to us. I'm not going to be help everybody. I'm, I'm not going to tell you that, right? You know, we had a family this week whose SNAP benefits were cut from, and I forget what they were cut from, but a lot. Um, and the problem was, in in the scheme of things, their regular allotment was only like fifty bucks, um, and so they've gone back to that, and it is creating real hardship. Nothing I can do about it. Nothing you can do about it in terms of the SNAP issue, but it's just something we need to be aware of. Um, However, there's a lot of people who aren't getting the, the amount of SNAP they should be. So what things matter? Family size, income, how much you are paying in rent or mortgage, whether you have utility expenses. Here's one that gets missed a lot. Medical expenses over $35 a month for seniors and people with disabilities. Why does that matter? If you're paying $100 a month in medical costs each month, that you know, you, that will be taken into account in determining your, the amount of food benefits you get. Um, so it's really important that this information be provided to DHSS. Um, we've put some links on there to how to report changes. Um, yeah, um, the phone system is, shall we say, quirky at best. Um, you can go in person. That's, that's one way to do it. I will say you can do it online. If you go in person, get a receipt. If you don't get a receipt, you didn't give it to them. And I'm just going to say this because they will lose it. They lose papers every day of the week. And that causes hardship. I, of course they do. It happens. You know, they've got a lot of paper coming in. Uh, they have a lot of folks that they have to work with. They're understaffed. Um, papers get lost. Um, but it's really important that changes be reported so that families can get the maximum food stamps. And one of the areas we also work with clients on is people who get taken off food stamps on the grounds that they've been trafficking their food stamps at stores that you know they're not that you have know, been bad actors. We do those cases. So if you're working with someone who has recently been told we're taking away your food stamps because you have committed, here's what they get accused of, an intentional program violation, you need to send them to us right away. Uh, one thing that we can't do is, oh, yes, they sent me a notice six months ago. Did you appeal it? No, why not? Well, I didn't understand I could. Get them to us early. Don't be, don't, if in doubt, send them to see us. Um, okay, that's the snap unwinding. Now let's talk about the Medicaid unwinding. And there's a couple of components of this. Um, back at the beginning of the pandemic, Congress passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And if I say it once, I'm never going to say it again uh, because I stumble all over it. What's important to note about this is this prevented Medicaid cutoffs except in three tiny circumstances. 
You ask to be cut off, parentheses. I can't imagine anyone asking the department to take their Medicaid away, but you know, whatever. Um, you moved out of state or you died. Um, so there was almost no circumstances under which you could cut people off Medicaid. Um, there were some people that they improperly cut off and we worked with them at the time. But what this meant was it, you know, they didn't have to do renewals. It didn't matter if your circumstances changed. It didn't matter if your income changed. For the duration of the pandemic, people kept their Medicaid. And this was throughout the country. And I will tell you, there is great data on how beneficial this was for families. Keeping Medicaid, keeping health insurance, obviously makes a difference to the health of the family. Uh, and the number of insured people shot up during the pandemic because new people got put on Medicaid and nobody got cut off. So essentially, you had more people being added to the rolls and the federal government was prohibited. Well, you know, the federal statute told states they're prohibited from cutting people off. Um, and no, the feds were paying the vast majority of this. Obviously, there were some costs to the state. But, you know, I, I don't think there's any advocate or health worker or public health person that doesn't think this was, an inc you know, was incredibly beneficial to families during a pandemic. It was one of the, again, I'm not, I am not, I, you are never going to hear me say good things came out of the pandemic. That is a very odd thing to say, but increasing systemically and materially the number of people who had comprehensive health insurance is a good thing. Um, Unfortunately, of course, um, yeah, we're done um, with that. In late 2022, Congress decided, no, we're not going to do that anymore. The pandemic is coming to an end. The public health emergency is ending. No more um, continuous enrollment in Medicaid. Um, and what does that mean? What that means, and now this is the complicated part. This is the complicated part. Um, Beginning in Mar at the end of March, so a couple of weeks ago, the states are going to begin resuming what we'll call normal operations, meaning they will do redeterminations, they will do recertifications, they are now going to look at your income to see if you're eligible. And for many families who may not have even communicated with the department, they are going to need to communicate with the department to tell them what their circumstances are, or they're going to get cut off. So the most important thing for families and families that you work with, and the most important message to get out is you need to update your information with DHSS. And, and the department is trying to do that too. And I, I'll, I have a couple of slides on that in a minute. They're not doing it all at once. Um, you know, there, there is some, you know, there is some um, method to this madness. They are hoping to do what are called ex parte, which just means by themselves, redeterminations for people that they know continue to be eligible. I'll just give you one example. If you're on SSI, Supplemental Security Income, SSI, you're automatically eligible for Medicaid. So if you're still on SSI, you don't need to worry about this. Those folks are not going to be affected by this. Um, because they continue to be eligible, but merely by the fact that they're getting SSI. Um, so, you know, DHSS has been preparing for this. Oh, numbers? Um, yeah, there's an extra 65,000 people on Medicaid from the beginning of the pandemic. So there are, you know, so that's a, that's a lot of folks. And again, let's think of Delaware's population, which is right around a million. A third of Delaware's population gets Medicaid benefits. One third of Delaware's population gets Medicaid benefits. That is a lot of people. That is a lot of people in our communities. Um, it's a hundred and, you know, not to be precise, but of course we were because we got the numbers, 178,492 households. That is a lot of households. And the department is going to go through them, you know, a ninth of a time by month. Um, and the renewal packets went out about a week uh I guess last week, the renewal pack, if I could say it, the renewal packets went out last week. And so again, if you have families who are talking, they've got to fill them out. They've got to make corrections. They've got to get this right. Because if they don't cooperate, they're going to get cut off. 
So it's important, again, I know dealing with DHSS is never the easiest thing. It's almost like a full-time job and there's lots of paperwork. And I will say, particularly if, you, if English is not your primary language, it is a difficult and daunting process. Nevertheless, this is why all of you folks on the phone, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is because we are going, we, we as a community need to enlist everybody's help in trying to keep as many people on as can possibly be kept on. And it's going to take a, a not so much at legal advocacy, although there'll be some of that, but, and I mean this in the best way, what I would call proactive social work advocacy, helping people complete forms, making sure the forms get to the welfare department, making sure that the, the department doesn't lose them. And you know, basically push, 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 push to get this done right. And to make sure that families don't fall between the cracks. Yes, there are families who will fall between the cracks. Our job is to make that number as small as we can. Um, so this first part, postpartum has been expanded from three months to a year. That's a huge thing. And we're, we're extremely grateful that the department did that. Um, certain other groups are going to be much less in danger. Um, the people who are most at risk are people who are in the community and are getting expanded Medicaid, who are not getting significant services based upon disabilities. You know, working families. Parents and children, single adults um, who are not disabled. Those are the folks who are going to be in the most danger of losing their benefits. People who have gone back to work. Um, those are the folks who are going to be in most danger of losing their benefits. You got 30 days to return the packet. You don't return it. You are going to get a nasty gram. What is a nasty gram? Dear John, you did not return your packet. We are cutting off your Medicaid. That's a nasty gram. You have a right to appeal that. And we would encourage anyone who gets one of those to appeal it. And you get to keep your Medicaid while you fight about it. But, it, you know, and I can't say this enough times, this is going to be a bureaucratic nightmare for the clients, for social service agencies, for the department, for everybody. Trying to unwind, you know, 50, 60,000 people's coverage is a big deal. Again, I, they have to do it. There's no, I mean, this is not, this is not me ranting and raving about the department being evil. That is that they have no choice but to do redeterminations. They have no choice but to cut off people who are uh, not eligible. Our job is to make this the least ugly as we can for folks and to keep as many people on as we can. And they will make mistakes. Don't get me wrong. I make mistakes. Everyone on this phone call makes mistakes. The department will make mistakes. Uh, even if they were, the, you know, almost flawless, they would make mistakes because it because when you are dealing with this much paper and this many people, of course, you're going to make mistakes. You know, we all do. Um, they are sending things out with various mechanisms, although I do have some skepticism about what they're sending out to people who for whom English is not their uh, primary language. But that's a whole other issue. So if you have clients who are getting things in English only and they are not um, uh, primary English speakers, call us, call me. Don't, I got, a, I got a point about that in a minute, but you are, anyone on this call is, will, is more than welcome to call me um, personally and directly. Don't send clients to me directly. I'm not happy. I, I don't have the volume to handle the cases myself, but any one of you on, the, on this call is absolutely welcome to call me. Um, I'm, my number I think is at the end. Okay. Um, we like passive renewals. We love pass ex parte or passive renewals. That just means, oh yes, dear Susan, you're you're still eligible. Carry on. We love that. Uh, all right. Can you submit your renewal? Yes, you can submit your renewal if you miss the deadline. You might lose coverage if you haven't appealed. Um, if you disagree with the cutoff, appeal, appeal, appeal. Our mantra is appeal now, think later. Appeal now, think later. When do you have to appeal? You have to appeal before the day which the cutoff is supposed to take place. They have to give you at least 10 days notice of that. Sometimes it's more. Appeal, appeal, appeal. Uh, all right. Um, what do you do if you're not eligible? Yes. Um, I don't know if there's anyone here from uh, Westside. Uh, Westside is going to help people. Um, do to see if they can get marketplace coverage. Almost everybody who is not eligible for continued Medicaid is going to be able to get marketplace coverage with a good subsidy, right? So 
it is for most people, this is not going from Medicaid to death and destruction and nothing. It's going to be switching from Medicaid to a very good, but you still have to pay something for it, uh, Affordable Care Act plan. Um, so it is un from the vast majority of people, unless they have huge changes in income, the, you know, the option isn't Medicaid or nothing. It's going to be Medicaid or something under the ACA. I've put the quality insights and West Five Family Healthcare numbers up there. They have been designated to help folks with this. I suspect they're going to be extraordinarily busy over the coming year, uh, but they're going to have an incredibly important role in helping people transition from Medicaid to ACA coverage. All right. That's all I got on that topic. I do want to talk about another topic, which uh, I got to tell you, this was a bit. This is a big and fun success story of advocacy, um, uh, and and the department again being willing to take a look at things. Let's take a step back. Generally speaking, under the Medicaid Act, you can get three months of retroactive coverage from when the month in which you apply. Uh, and that is a general federal rule. So if I applied today, and I, which is April uh, 19th, and I was eligible in January, February, and March, I could have Medicaid go back and cover those three months so that any unpaid bills that I had would be covered by Medicaid. Obviously, if I just couldn't get care, you can't go back and magically get care retroactively, but it would protect you against unnecessary medical debt. That was the general rule. The general rule also allows states to ask for waivers of the general rule and have special rules in their state. The purpose of the waiver is to allow states to explore whether the waiver promotes the objective of the Medicaid Act and it should be granted for as long as the state wants to conduct the experiment. Uh, in Delaware, they had a waiver on retroactive coverage for the last 27 years. Now, it wasn't in effect everybody, but for 27 years, I know, I know, you're asking yourself, what? For 27 years, a certain part of the population who was Medicaid eligible could not get three months of coverage. Yeah. Did they, no, did they, no. That waiver is set to expire at the end of 2023. Um, we decided to take this matter on because we think it's an important matter. And our uh, and so this is a national issue. Some other states have been doing this too. Um, the only and I'm just going to say this bluntly because I, at this point I'm just going to say it. The only thing the waiver did was was cost shift from the Medicaid program to low income Medicaid eligible families. The only thing it did was put medical bills on low income medical med eligible people for Medicaid. It did nothing. It did nothing to improve care or encourage people to apply early. So, uh, and you know, and who bears the burden of medical debt? Again, low income families of color. So we decided to ask the department to walk away from this waiver. Um, and they did. The department has indicated that um, when this current waiver expires at the end of the year, that they're going to walk away from it and that they're no longer going to ask for it. They had also, I uh, just incidentally, they had tried to expand it to pregnant women and children, but the feds told them they couldn't. Um, so that was back in, in you know, in, in um, 19 or 18. Uh, but as of when we, you know, and they've published something on this, this is, you know, they, they, they published a, a, a proposed ruling on this. They are walking away from this aspect of the waiver, and they are no longer going to say to people, no three months retroactive coverage. And again, uh, we are grateful that the department has taken this important step so that they will, so that families, hopefully starting in 2024, will be able to get uh, retroactive coverage for up to three months. Um, again, why is it important? We, many of you on this call probably know medical debt is a real problem. Uh, it, it causes huge amounts of financial hardship for low and moderate income families. It is a major cause of bankruptcy. It ruins credit. Um, and in a case like this, it was, it was totally inflicted by the state um, uh, in that they, you know, for many years, um, they were 
shifting those costs from the Medicaid agency to low-income families. But again, to their credit, got to give them credit on where it's due. They have agreed to walk away from this. So we are delighted about that. Okay. All right. want to talk a little bit about work we do. Um, one of the things that we encourage you to do when you're working with families is ask them if they're getting benefits. And if they're not, something in your head should be saying, why are you, why is this family not getting SNAP? You know, you should, you know, there should be alarm bells in your head that if low income families are not getting benefits, the question is why not? Why is this person, if someone, yeah, why is this person not getting benefits? Why does this person have no income? And, and yes, sometimes I just lost a job and I'm going to get another one. There may, lot, there may be reasons why I, yeah, but over, and I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing, I know I look like I'm 35, but I've actually been doing this work for 35 years. Lots and lots of eligible families don't apply because they don't understand that they're eligible. They don't know what the program is. They have misconceptions about the program um, and they don't apply. So there's a lot of families who are eligible for benefits who don't get them and who as a result are struggling. So, and you know, credit to the food bank, they will help. We do not do applications. The food bank does. The food bank helps people do applications. So there is help to do this. Um, you know, ask if you, again, we all have too much to do, but I would encourage you to ask people that if you're in direct service or if you're supervising people who are in direct service, have them ask. Again, you want to do it in a way that is um, inclusive and non-judgmental. But if you have enough of a relationship with the family, ask them if they're having trouble with their benefits. A lot of people don't understand that there are remedies that they, that, 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 that they, can, that they can fight challenge the department and that the department makes mistakes. They're a government bureaucracy. Even if they only make a mistake 1% of the time, that's a lot of people. And then send them to us. We're doing benefit cases. We have significantly expanded. We have two, two full-time lawyers who are doing benefits work. They're wonderful people. Some of you, you may know them, uh, Abby Samuels and Gilbert Pierre. Um, just send them to our office for intake on any of these problems. And when I say problems, that's denial of application, cut off, reduction in benefits. Those are the big three, right? Um, send them. And then any of you should call me with questions. I'm happy. You know, call me. Say, oh, I'm not sure if we should send this person over. I'm happy to have a conversation with you about that. Um, but don't send them to me directly. Uh, you know, I, I cannot have my phone. There's, I, you know, I don't know how many people are on this call. There's a, oh, 68. Okay. Yeah, no, I cannot have 60. I cannot have 200 clients calling my phone and blowing it up. But I love working with advocates. I love working with social workers. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, I can talk about benefits for days on end without stopping, you know, but I'm not going to do that today. I'll, I'll stop shortly. Um, so call me if you've got questions. Um, I, you know, there's nothing more that I love chatting than with about his benefits. Um, this is just quickly about how to apply. And again, I'm I'm thinking that COC will make these slides available, so you do not need to write this stuff down. That, no, you'll get you'll get it on the slides. Um, Social Security is very difficult to deal with. I'm just telling you that. Understand it's difficult. Understand that they are a very challenged agency. They, uh, some of it's their fault. Some of it's, a lot of it is Congress's fault. What do I mean by that? They are grossly underfunded. They have more paper coming in every day than they can process. Why? Because Congress doesn't give them enough money to run the agency. They have too few people and they can't keep staff. So they are grossly, grossly understaffed um, and they're really very bureaucratic. Um, but again, we do a lot of work on, uh, on helping people get their benefits back on um, with Social Security and SSI. Incredibly important agency because the benefits are much higher than state benefits. Uh, again, they're not generous, but just to give you, I remember, you know, like, which seems like hours ago, we talked about a TANF grant for two people being $270. A single person SSI grant is $914. And while that is still way under poverty, it is so much better than TANF, right? $914 versus $270, yeah. So social security and SSI benefits, incredibly important to struggling families. 
Hey, John, uh, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Oh, it looks like you're almost done. I am <laughs> almost done. There's a question in the chat. Um, do you want to answer it now or I could just let wait. me just I'm, I'm I'm like three moments away from being done. Perfect. Sorry Here's our three offices with phone numbers. Look at that. That was a miracle. Um, there we go. I'm done. I'm and I'll leave that up for while we talk. Again, I'm hoping that COC will provide this slide deck so you can have all of this. But th that's our contact numbers. And I I can't remember if Myla's if my direct stuff is at the beginning here. Uh, go ahead and ask the question while we're doing that. Sure. Yeah. Um. So the question it is was... here's my direct contact info too. Thanks, John. So the question was: Does Classly help with any initial applications, or just if there are problems like denials, etc.? The latter. We do not help people apply. We do not have the resources to do that. But if it's state benefits, I, you know, I'm not sure if there's anyone from the food bank on the call. <laughs> They'll hate me, right? Um, the food bank helps people apply. They also help with redeterminations. Um, so we don't. You know, we will tell people to. We just do. Let's just be, I will be absolutely blunt about this. We don't have the staff to help with applications. We will tell people to apply, but we are not helping people complete applications. It is time consuming, but it's not difficult legally. You don't have to have a law degree to help someone apply. Um, it is I. It is a skill because you've got to work with them. And then one of the big things on applications that's really important and that sometimes that you have to work with certain families and individuals to get them to understand, why should I give them any information about me and my finances? Well, because if you want their benefits, they're entitled to know those things. You know, you don't get, you, there's a great loss of privacy when you're trying to get benefits, you know, financial benefits from the government. I don't want to show them my bank account. I'm sorry. Uh, you have to. I don't want to tell them how much I make. I, you know, you want to get the benefits, you got to tell them how much you make. And, you know, you and I can rail about why we should give benefits to everybody at a certain level, but that's not going to change where we are. The, uh, you know, the brutal reality is you've got to show them that you meet their financial rules and you have to do that by showing bank accounts and income. And I'm sorry. And, you know, and sometimes that takes explaining to families um, and, you know, in order to get the, and then the other thing is one other big, a lot of people feel shame um, and that, oh, I, I shouldn't have to apply for this. This is why that's a it's, it's just a barrier that we have to work with families on, um, and that these are these are these benefits are for people in need. There is no shame in getting benefit. It's not, and I will tell you, rich we get rich people, middle class people, we get benefits from the government every day. It's just not called welfare, right? Um, but you know, we get tax deductions for our mortgage. We get all sorts of stuff. We get all sorts of um, things from the government that we don't think of as public assistance, but they absolutely are. I think, you know, we need to sort of, we need to work on removing the shame from getting public benefits. Um, all right. Now I've, I've been on my soapbox for probably way too long. So I will, uh, I'm not sure how much of my time I use, but close enough. I'm going to stop. That's great. If anyone has any questions, I think we're doing, actually, we're ahead of schedule, right? We have a some some time to review um, some of the things that came in chat. And also if anyone has any questions for John, interrupt me for sure. But in the chat, um, while you were talking, John, <laughs> um, actually before, before I talk about something different, uh, one of the questions was specific to you, John, and you answered it. It was about um, if you help with applications. Yeah. And then also um, Renee um, with um, State Service Center mentioned that Quality Insight staff's going to be at the State Service Centers helping people if they've been disenrolled. So we've heard that they'll help. But is there someone that helps applications? Not the food bank helps with SNAP with applications. Uh, they help with better. It's a. They will all. It's a combined application. Right. Uh, but so, that's right. It is. It is. So, so that's also they help helping, with Medicaid too. It, it, absolutely, a SNAP right. application Perfect. is a Medicaid application. Absolutely, it, you I, just got to check the box, it. right? It's the same info, and in fact, yeah, it, it, yes, yes. Um, so, so applying for SNAP, if you just check the box, is also applying for Medicaid, and yeah, it's a twofer, right? You get that. Yes, as well. yes, um, I had forgotten that. Great. No, I know it's 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 yeah. So we so the food bank. I mean, I will tell you, it's an incredibly valuable service to help people apply. Awesome. Um, and again, interrupt me as I'm sharing things that I saw in the chat. Um, Kate um, announced about the Sussex Housing Group. They're hosting a 
poverty simulation on the 25th of May um, from two to five at Dell Tech. And you can register at Eventbrite, look in the chat. Um, but anyway, that's gonna be a really great um, resource, I think. Um, and just um, reiterate that, you know, the community resource fairs that um, Renee Beeman had mentioned, those are really great opportunities. If you don't know how to get connected, just contact your local um, state service center and they can give you get you on the email blast and the invites to share information about what, what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, I don't know if there's any other announcements or things to share. Are we done early? Is that, is that possible? It's possible. Does anyone have any other questions or comments for John? I know Kim had asked um, just a second ago, John, to go back to the last slide with the contact information of the offices. Um, I don't know if you can copy and paste it in the chat if that's easier at this point. We are going to have the slides um, available. Sophie, can you tell people where they can find them after the, the meeting? Um, absolutely. So we will be also sending out a follow-up email as well with the link included, but currently in the Outlook um, invite, there's a link to the meeting folder. It's just going to be under um, in our public COC folder under the April quarterly meeting. There is a direct link in the Outlook invite as well as our constant contact um, that everybody should have gotten, I think, um, earlier this week. And then again, we will be also sending a, a follow-up email, um, if not later today, most likely early tomorrow with the recording, um, the link to all the materials, and we'll have our slides that we've gone over today um, included as well. Oh, and there's also going to be a link available on our website too, on our COC member page. Great. Thank you, Sophie. I think we can uh, grant people back 20 minutes of their day. Awesome. Sounds good to me too. Thank you all for joining. It's um, such a, a great um, opportunity to get together. Um, I hope everyone is taking advantage of the chat, making connections, making those networks. That's what the COC is all about, the continuum of care. Each one of us have an important part to play and um, we, you are the continuum of care. So we thank you for joining us and being a part of our presentation today. Um, we hope it was fruitful and enjoy your, the rest of this beautiful spring day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. And um, we look forward to seeing you all on May 18th at Day for Housing in Dover. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh.